the grace of giving. Several years ago, when Diane and I were missionaries in Spain, we received a very pleasant surprise. Someone in her home church, and we knew nothing about this ahead of time, someone in her home church left us $600 in their will. Can you imagine how you surprised you would be? Out of the blue, somebody says, you get a call from Samara, and she says, by the way, or maybe from Sherry, somebody left $600 to you in their will because you're serving the Lord. We weren't aware of it until we were formed with the gifts uh, after the person had passed, and I didn't even know the person. My wife had grown up in that home church, and she did know the person, but I didn't even know them. Now, while that amount, $600, was not life-transforming, we were deeply touched and honored that someone would think of us in that way, and we realized that we had been shown grace, right? Undeserved merit and favor by this person. We were the recipients of someone's grace, and it was a beautiful surprise. Now, the Methodist Mission Board, uh, when you go to a new country, they, give, they don't ship furniture around the world, so they give you a budget to get the basics you need in your house, your bed, a you know, table to eat on, and things like that. And so they provided us with our, our beds and washing machine, refrigerator, that stuff. Well, after 18 years, and we decided to come back to the United States, then we had to get rid, rid of that stuff, and plus we had accumulated our own personal possessions. And since they don't um, move furniture around the world, we had to get rid of some things. Well, Diane and I decided to give things away rather than to try to sell them. It is so much easier, believe me, than trying to sell something. Then you're always disappointed with how much someone's willing to give you, right? Always. Well, we decided, to, and we had done this in Mexico before, and so now we're in Spain and we're doing this. Well, we gave first pick to our colleagues and friends at the seminary, but they wanted very little of what we had. But there was an Ecuadorian couple, retired age couple, that helped in the Community Church of Madrid, an English-speaking international church, Telmo Rosario. And they had extended family there in Madrid. Uh, through the early 2000s, there was massive migration into Spain from, from Ecuador, parts of South America, North Africa, and Eastern Europe. I mean, after the United States, they were about the second country in terms of the number of, uh, of migrants coming into the country. So they know a little bit about what that's about. Well, Telmo and Rosario, of course, we had gotten to know them as they helped out in the church. And we offered... Okay, you can have what's left if you'd like it. Well, they, their extended family, they arranged for a truck and guys to come, and they took our ceiling fans and the refrigerator. Uh, we had a big dining table with six chairs, beautiful wood dining table and six chairs, and we had uh, a, a, a adult-sized bunk beds that were really solid and a queen-sized bed, among other things. Well, Diane and I... They, they, oh, we were so glad to, to get rid of it, and they were thrilled to receive it. About a year later, after we had come back to the States, about a year later, we went back to Spain for a visit, and we got a chance to see Telmo and Rosario at church, and they told us what a, a blessing that gift had meant. And the thing that Rosario, the wife, loved the most is that uh, they could fit all four of their grandchildren in bed with them in that big queen-size bed. <laughs> they were just thrilled about that. So Diane and I and had a chance, just as we'd received a $600 bequest, we were able to show some grace and favor to someone else. Well, today we're talking about the grace of giving. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches in Macedonia. Remember, Paul wrote a letter to the Philippi, to Philippians, that's in Macedonia. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. In this passage, Paul includes two contrasts that I want to, as examples of the grace of God to the Macedonian churches. First, he mentions the severe ordeal of affliction that resulted in their decision to follow Jesus Christ. We must remember that Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians while he was in prison. It's one of the prison epistles. So he's writing to these people about their affliction 
for following Jesus Christ. And he mentions it in the letter to the Philippians in chapter 1, 29 and 30. God has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. He's in affliction. He's in prison for the name of Christ. And he's recognizing their affliction, that the cost, their faith is having in their lives. But what surprises me is that Paul follows this reference to their affliction with a mention of abundant joy. For during a severe ordeal of affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. How does joy come out of affliction? How does joy come out of affliction? You know, when you have experienced the profound love of God in Jesus Christ, and you feel God's forgiveness in your heart, and you know God's presence in your life, then you can have joy even when everything is falling apart in your life. Is there an amen out there somewhere? <laughs> when you know the love of God and God's presence in your life, when you've experienced God, then you can have joy even when everything is falling apart. Unlike happiness, joy is not determined by your, our circumstances. It's determined by our connection with God. Living with God and following Christ is joyful. This is why the letter to the Philippians is one of the most, has one of the most references to joy and rejoicing in all the New Testament. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. He's saying this while he's in prison and writing to people who are suffering for their faith. So the contrast of affliction and joy in the Macedonians' experience, Paul is citing as an example of God's grace and favor on them. The second contrast is between poverty and generosity. Their extreme poverty has overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. They gave according to their means and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints, referring to the collection for the churches in Jerusalem. The Macedonians gave to help the Christians in Jerusalem, and they gave beyond their means. Now, how can Paul say that this is grace of God? First, they are giving as an act of gratitude for what Christ means in their lives, right? That act of giving is a response of gratitude to the grace that they have received. They want to help out with their sisters and brothers in Jerusalem because they know what it's like to go through hard times for the sake of Christ. Their empathy has motivated them to give. Gratitude, that empathetic identification with the person or the group in need is one of the things that, is a, that moves grace in the grace of giving. Back in the year 2000, some of you will remember, I know Pat will know this, the film Pay It Forward. You remember that? You know that film, don't you, Pat? You can go probably look it up. It was in 2000. It was based on a novel, uh, in 1990, a novel by Catherine Ryan Hyde. And the premise of the, the movie is that uh, when somebody uh, receives something good from somebody, totally unexpected, they have a specific need that they can't take care of by themselves, and then out of the blue, someone helps them with their need. The idea then is that because I have been the recipient of that goodness, then I will pay it forward to three other people. So I will look for opportunities, there's not a time limit on this, opportunities then to help someone else in a way that they cannot help themselves. It can be something very small. It can be something very big. It doesn't matter. But the idea is to pay it forward to three people. And the premise of the book as well is the idea is that this practice will spread through society at a ratio of three to one and have a major impact on society. I mean, just think about a minute. One person gives to three people. Those three give to three. That's nine. One, three, nine. Those nine people give to three people. That's 27. So in the movement of one, two, three movements, you've gone from one to 27. If my math could be wrong. But you get the idea of the powerful impact of that multiplication 
of paying it forward. And I think this is just a beautiful example of the grace of giving. You've received grace out of gratitude, and then you give, give it and pay it forward. I've received grace, and I'm going to multiply that grace as I give and help others. Now, returning to the Macedonian example, their giving is also an example of the grace of God because God has changed them. Receiving the grace of God isn't just God giving you something. Oh, that's nice. I give you a pumpkin and you've got a pumpkin. No, God's giving to us in Christ changes us. There are now new people. In Christ, they're the children of God. And not only that, the God's heart now beats in their heart, right? And the love that God has for people is now a part of who they are. Now the love of God is a part of their love as well. It's a part of who they are. So part of the grace of giving is we give out of the, because of the transformation that God is working in our lives. Isn't that wonderful? Remember what we said a couple of weeks ago that a great vision combined with a deep passion, motivate great sacrifice. If someone has a really big goal that requires everything they have, and maybe even more than they have, what motivates them to hang in there and, perceive, pers and persevere to the end is because they have a great vision, but also a deeply felt passion that go together. The Macedonians wanted to share in the ministry to the saints in Jerusalem because they had experience and they caused the shared vision of life of God in Jesus Christ. Hey, we've been where they are. They're now our brothers and sisters in Christ because of that connection, because of our experience of the grace of God and because now God is in our lives and we share that. That is part of the grace of giving. They were trying to live the Lord's Prayer. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As Paul talks about the grace of giving, he then goes on to give the supreme example, which is the example of Jesus Christ. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ. God's not asking something of us that God's not willing to do first and at a greater degree. Our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. This mirrors Philippians 2, 5 to 6, or 6 to 11, which is a beautiful hymn to Jesus Christ. And in that hymn, as in what Paul says here, the eternal Son of God, you know, the Son of God is, is eternal, is God, right? The, the three persons in one Godhead. He doesn't until he enters uh, humanity in, in Jesus and is born. Just imagine, the, Paul is referring to the eternal Son of God, how Rich, you can't eat, rich doesn't even describe God. I mean, the whole universe and all of creation, right? That's just way beyond any measure of riches. It just blows your mind. And yet, in spite of that, being God, he takes on human flesh. Humanity is poverty compared to being God, isn't it? I mean, that comparison, there is no comparison. But that's what he's saying for it. He was rich as the eternal son of God, and he becomes a human being, in that sense became poor. But as Paul makes clear in the hymn in Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus' humility isn't just becoming a human being. While being a human being, he was obedient to God to the point of actually resulting in a shameful death in our behalf. So the great vision that motivated the incarnation and Jesus' obedience to the point of a cross was what? Our redemption and eternal life. He did it all for us out of the love of God. So we have the example of the contrast of the richness of divinity becoming humanity on our behalf. Jesus Christ's example is key because God sets the example. God always gives first. God always gives the most. And God always gives the best. Amen? God always gives first. You never give first. God always gives first. God always gives more than we can even think of giving, and God always gives the best. We happen to be God's children. We're supposed to be emulating him, right? We've received God's incredible grace in Christ, and that is why we give grace to others. 
It's part of who we are, not only what we've received, it's part of the transformation and who we are. So the grace of giving is basically twofold. First, our giving is a sign of grace received. It's an act of gratitude. We give graciously, and I would say, not only out of gratitude, but out of sense of empathy for the person in need, because we've received abundant grace. When someone gives, you know they've always received something first so that they'd even be willing to give, right? That's part of the grace of giving. But second, grace of giving, uh, our giving is a channel of grace, sort of like the pay it forward idea. God's grace becomes tangible and real through people. We are the human face of God's love and God's presence. When Diane and I received that bequest from that man, we knew that it was not just a good-hearted person giving to us. We knew that God was gracing us through him. When Telmo and Rosario received our household goods, it wasn't just Mark and Diane being nice to them. They knew that God was gracing them as well. Community United Methodist Church is a grace-filled community. We are children of God, members of the body of Christ, and we're channels of God, of grace, and agents of God's presence in our community and in our world. We share the good news of God's saving grace in Christ, and we help people in many tangible ways. Through our needy family fund, we have recently paid the light bills and helped people with rent who are in desperate situations. Uh, we, at Thanksgiving and Christmas time, we give turkeys to about 75 different families. And we could use a little help with that fund, by the way. Our circle of friends sends cards to people and visits the sick and, and other people and encourages them and helps them out. Our Joyful Noise Preschool provides a, a safe and loving and faith-filled environment for children. Our food bank and community cares help sustain people through difficult times. We do all of this and more because members of our community have experienced the grace of God, and we want to pay it forward. The love of God fills our hearts, and we want to make that love tangible and real to people. Our giving is cheerful, and it's joyful because we feel it is a privilege to share in Christ's ministry. We understand how the Macedonians could be joyful in the midst of, of affliction and generous in spite of their need. In a word, giving is grace. We give because of grace received. And the act of giving itself is gracious, joyful privilege because it shows who we truly are as followers of Jesus Christ. Praise be to God for his indescribable gift.